At the behest of the April 2009 Free Venice Beachhead, Venice High School students in my classes wrote to Los Angeles, then Los Angeles City Council member Bill Rosendahl, to urge his support for a permanent memorial to the Japanese American experience during World War II to remind people what had happened here. When the Beachhead published my students' emails to Rosendahl, Emily Winters of the Venice Arts Council read them and contacted me to work together to build this memorial. Please welcome a founding member of the Venice Arts Council and the VGM Committee, Emily Winters. Well, thank you um, for being here, everyone. <clears throat> this is such an important monument. <clears throat> I think um, Alice sort of said a lot of things that I was going to say. <laughs> so <clears throat> I just want to concentrate on the Arts Council and how <clears throat> uh, Phyllis had thought, we thought we were going to put a plaque here. And then we saw, well, we didn't want it on the ground so people would step on it. We wanted something that would be more respectful. And we finally came up with this idea of <clears throat> the uh, obelisk, which is this kind of a symbol of Manzanar, which is on their grave sites. So uh, that, that happening, I can't tell you how wonderful it's been working with this group. A lot of Venice groups are very contentious, arguing, fighting. This group is so mellow. They're, uh, I think it's because they're Buddhists. <laughs> and uh, I have loved every, every meeting and enjoying their friendship. Um, this monument is so important now, as you hear on the news, how this racial and ethnic rift between groups is becoming more and more pronounced due to the due to our president's horrible attitude so i feel this is such an important monument and we have reached so many people who have said i didn't know this happened and they're very moved by it so i want to thank uh, phyllis and all the pe people that participated and gave money to it to make it happen. And obviously we had many, many small donations that were an important part of putting this up. This is a, a 14,000 pound solid granite. So uh, it can't be have cracks in it or chips in it. And we've only had one tag and it came off right away. So. Uh, Thank you for all your support, and thank you to the BJM Committee and the Arts Council members. Venice Arts Council introduced the BJM Committee to the Venice Community Housing, which serves as the fiscal sponsor to the Venice Arts Council. They became BJM Committee's fiscal sponsor as well. This allowed the BJM Committee to apply for a National Park Service Japanese American Confinement Sites Grant under the sponsorship of the nonprofit Venice Community Housing Corporation. In March 2012, the National Park Service Japanese American Confinement Sites Grant Program awarded the VGM $50,000, which we matched with the $25,000 in private donations. The grant included funds for the building and installation of the VGM, as well as for teacher training. We thank the Venice community housing for its support under the leadership of now retired Steve Clare and we deeply appreciate its executive director since 2016 Betsy Becky Dennison for continuing their support of the VGM. The VCH sponsors a program called Youth Build and we are very happy to introduce its associate director Tihana Kilichi to explain Youth Build's relationship with the VGM. It's really a pleasure to be here with you all today. Um, as she said, VCH is the fiscal sponsor for VJAM and has been so since their inception. And we've been so honored to play that small role to ensure the monument was completed and is now contributing to Venice in so many ways. Our ongoing partnership is solidified by both VJAM and VCH's purpose in standing up against injustice and ensuring we know our painful histories as a means of preventing future injustice. We view them as a close and important community partner and have grown this organizational relationship into something I am personally very proud of 
and that is the education and ethical action young people deserve to unleash in their communities. At YouthBuild, young people 18 to 24 make the choice to earn credits towards completing their high school diploma, as well as job training and construction related fields, able to obtain work experience building affordable housing and earning nationally recognized trade certificates. This prepares them for their future. What's especially important though is the leadership development they gain through activities like community service projects as AmeriCorps members, preparing them for everyone's future. Two amazing YouthBuild alumni are here today in bright orange shirts and they've learned firsthand about our local history because of VJAM and committee leaders like Phyllis. These young gentlemen have learned about the history of their past community members being treated unfairly and cruelly. They've read these words every month before cleaning this beautiful monument and the surrounding space where you all sit now. And they've made important, thoughtful, critical realizations about themselves and their own heritage through this process, developing their cultural competency and personal values in a way that has made them leaders, young leaders in the Venice community. YouthBuild is a movement and we feel deeply that VGM and the work we do together for our community's history, present learning and future growth is what will create social change and a world where peace, understanding and opportunity are available to all and where we treat each other with love and respect. I love and respect YouthBuild and have loved this partnership and what it's done for Moises and Justice over there and many other young leaders in Venice Youth Build. Thank you, Phyllis, for this past year, and I look forward to us maximizing our fight for justice and commemoration while empowering young leaders to do the same. Thank you. The late Los Angeles City Council Member Bill Rosenthal of District 11 had always been a champion of the VJAM project. The late Councilman's Chief of Staff, Mike Bonin, succeeded Bill Rosenthal to the Los Angeles City Council and continue the city's 11th district support for the VGEM. We thank Council Member Mike Bonin for his continuing support of the VGEM, for the chairs you're sitting on, the lectern I'm speaking from, and particularly his planning deputy, Len Wen. Four members of the Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors had made significant donations to the VGEM. Don Canabe, formerly of the 4th District, Mark Ridley Thomas, currently of the 2nd District, and Xavier Oslovsky, formerly of the 3rd District, in which the VGM sits. Supervisor Sheila Cool, Zeb's successor, followed her predecessor's example and also made a significant contribution to the VGM. Representing Supervisor Sheila Cool is her field deputy, Zachary Gaidzik. It's an honor to be here on behalf of LA County Supervisor Sheila Kuhl to commemorate this monument, which stands here as a testament to one of the darkest days in American history. As we have spoken about several times, this year marks the 77th anniversary of President Roosevelt's, Roosevelt's signing of Executive Order 9066, which forced the removal of 120,000 Japanese and American citizens of Japanese ancestry on the West Coast. This monument is an important tribute to the over 1,000 persons of Japanese ancestry who were forcibly removed from Venice, Santa Monica, and Malibu. I personally grow up, grew up in Santa Monica and just thinking about the experiences of the individuals here today and of the family members who knew them here today, of, having to be, of being taken forcibly from your home is heartbreaking. In today's political climate, perhaps more than at any time since that fateful day in 1942, Americans must be mindful of the progress we have made, but we must work hard to defend and protect the rights of our most vulnerable population. It's important that we honor and recognize what happened to our Japanese American citizens in 1942 in order to bring about a better future for ourselves, for our children, and for those who call this place home. And I specifically want to thank all of the people who worked so hard to create this here. I was speaking earlier um, about how once a monument like this goes up, it can't come down. And that's something that I am so glad for generations to come, they'll be able to see this and remember its history. Thank you. In 2011, then Assembly Member Betsy Butler and then State Senator Ted Liu co-sponsored Assembly Concurrent Resolution 46. They requested that the California Department of Transportation grant an encroachment permit for the placement of the VGM at the northwest corner of Venice and Lincoln in the public right-of-way. 
The resolution passed both State Assembly and the State Senate, and the VGM Committee complied with all requirements of the California Department of Transportation. Since 2015, Ted Lieu has represented California Congressional District 33 in the United States House of Representatives. He is in Washington, D.C. today, keeping tabs on the current administration and tweeting out his outrage. <laughs> Here to represent Congressman Lou, District Director, Director Nicholas Rodriguez. Thank you, Phyllis. And uh, I, I just wanted to say um, it's an honor to be here on behalf of Congressman Lou, uh, who represents uh, the communities of Venice, Malibu, and Santa Monica um, here in the 33rd District. Um, it's beautiful to see the community come together uh, on this day to pay tribute to those of Japanese ancestry whose constitutional rights were violated as a result of Executive Order 9066. As you all know, it's, it's been 77 years. Uh, 77 years since this occurred, and although progress has been made, uh, it's important now, more than ever, uh, to take action to continue the conversation surrounding uh, inclusivity and equality for all communities and to remain ever vigilant about protecting all of our civil rights. We live in such a diverse world um, and it's important to celebrate that diversity. Um, I'd like to take the time to, to recognize the Venice Japanese American Memorial Committee for all their hard work in establishing this wonderful monument and for their dedication to education and outreach. On behalf of the congressman, I'd like to present uh, the committee with a congressional certificate and commend each and every one of you for your bold leadership and outstanding commitment to the community. Uh, the work that you do serves as an inspiration to us all. So Phyllis, if you can join me up here. Our next speaker wears a black suit and fedora of his maternal grandmother, Charles Kozo Katooka. He wears a vintage number tag that all persons of Japanese ancestry were required to wear during processing and for his family's transport from the Santa Anita Assembly Center to the American Concentration Camp at Roar, Arkansas. To tell his family's story, here is Ken Seno Katooka. Ah, you probably, some people are probably wondering, why is he dressed like a pachuco? <laughs> now, this is what people wore back then, you know. They didn't go out in a t-shirt and a pair of Levi's. They wore a suit and a nice fedora. That's how my grandfather, that's how he dressed. Charles, Charles Kozo Katooka was born January 5th, 1886, and he died June 8th, 1977. He lived for 91 years. 1905, he, uh, he emigrated, immigrated to the United States. He was only 19 years old. He got on a boat, came to San Francisco, and all of a sudden he was in the land of, the, of plenty. And uh, he identified with America. He, all through his life, he identified as being an American. Uh, he was unable to get married here because there were laws against miscegenation. So he sent away for a bride to Japan. They called them picture brides. You get a catalog, you get pictures of nice ladies, and uh, hopefully they actually look like that when you get them here. So he took a chance. He went to the harbor, San Francisco, waited for her, held up a sign, and there she was. And luckily for me, I'm here. Luckily, they said, yeah, I'll marry you. <laughs> and then eight kids later, this happened, uh, Executive Order 9066, February 19, 1942. Uh, uh, general John DeWitt was in charge. He was appointed by Roosevelt. He was the commanding general of Western Defense Command. And he was appointed by Roosevelt because of his views. Here's one of DeWitt's views. A Jap is a Jap. It makes no difference whether he's an American citizen or not. So that's what we got, and that's why we got sent to all these camps, 10 camps around, and a few other smaller ones for, for um, the ones that they deemed as uh, unruly and, uh, and uh, uncontrollable. 
and those are the ones that we really got to worry about today. Um, 2,000 people died while imprisoned in these camps from smallpox, whooping cough, flu, typhoid fever, diphtheria, and tuberculosis. The practice of Shinto or Buddhism was prohibited in camp and it was enforced by the MPs. The land of the free, the home of the brave was just a phrase. Paper. It's just paper, right? Just roll it up and throw it away. So my question is, is this just a piece of paper? These were posted all over LA, San Francisco, Washington, Oregon, and that meant we had to get out. I say we, the Japanese Americans, my ancestors, had to get out within seven to 10 days. That meant getting rid of all your stuff, getting rid, you know, if you could sell it, you'd get maybe five to 10 cents on the dollar of what it was worth. But you had to get rid of everything and all of a sudden, you couldn't keep your house, you couldn't keep the place that you used to rent. All of a sudden it's gone and most people just looted their homes after they left and there was no more. So is this just a piece of paper? Um, the, ones that I'm, the ones that I'm wearing and I have on the um, suitcase here, I'm, I just made them as, uh, as uh, reproductions, but this my grandpa kept. This is the original deal. You'll notice it's dirty. It's been handled a lot. Even the string here is dirty. And I ask myself, why is it so dirty? I submit that my grandfather over the years would hold this in his hands. While he was a gardener, he was a landscaper, he'd hold this in his hands and think about the injustice that happened to him, what he could have been, what he could have accomplished with those kids, what kind of college education he could have gave them. So that's what I think went on. And after reading a lot of Aldous Huxley, I found, you know, he was a quiet guy. I asked him about his experience. He went, that's the Japanese way, way of saying, it's not gonna happen. No, I asked him about his experience and he, he wouldn't talk about it. I found these quotes by Aldous Huxley. After silence, that which comes nearest to the expressing of the inexpressible is music. Another one, every man's memory is his private literature. So, Aldous Huxley also said one more thing, that men do not learn very much from the lessons of history is the most important of all the lessons of history. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ken. The Manzanar Committee will hold its 50th annual Manzanar pilgrimage on Saturday, April the 27th. It's always the last Saturday of April. We thank Bruce Embry, co-chair of the Manzanar Committee, for coming today to speak about the 50th annual Manzanar pilgrimage. Congratulations, Bruce. Thank you, Phyllis. Um, it's always good to be here. Uh, it, it's, it, it, the VJAM is truly an inspiration, as Ted Lu's uh, representative mentioned. It's an inspiration in so many ways, and, and this will never go away, which I think is really, truly one of the most important things to remember. Because our tale here um, is an important one to never forget. And I think the VJAM committee is an inspiration for a lot of reasons, but one of the reasons why I think it's so, uh, such an important, important event to come to, even though we're going crazy with our planning, is that it came about in a way that our Manzanar committee was formed, uh, started by Warren Furutani, who's gonna follow me. Um, thank, thank you, Phyllis, for putting me before Warren, because he's a very hard act to follow. Um, but I, I think it was a, uh, sense of, 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 of outrage and, um, and righteous anger. We've come to know it as righteous anger and indignation and concerned people who came together and uh, began to plan. And the VGM committee in particular, I think, is a good model to, to think about how we can bring about social change because they went to those who were directly affected. And those who were directly affected are here today. And so I feel like I'm kind of, it's a homecoming with uh, Mary, who uh, has 
graced the stage of Manzanar at, at our pilgrimage many, many, many years and sang. Um, sometimes we've, we've been wise enough to, to, to bring the tape recorder, um, but she's also uh, been a cappella. And May and Arnold, of course, and Arnold's wife, who was a very uh, good friend of, of my mother. Um, but I think that uh, these local I I I specific efforts to educate um, our country about what happened are very, very important. We just had one, uh, another victory that happened in Bishop, California. Bishop, which is right outside of Manzanar, so, you know, many of you go skiing up there and know Bishop. The Bishop City Council passed two resolutions during World War II. Both of those resolutions uh, were w sent to the War Department and to the federal government, asking the federal government not to allow anyone from Manzanar to be allowed into Bishop or the surrounding area. They were very concerned for their safety. Okay, they said that the uh, Mary and Arnold, my mother and May, and they were a threat somehow to the community. Not just a national threat, but a direct threat to their way of life, this mystical way of life that we keep hearing about. Those resolutions were overturned last week by a young, newly elected city council member. And we are very happy that that happened. The response from the War Department to the Bishop City Council was instructive of the way that the federal government looked at its own citizens and, and residents of our, of our country. The War Department's response was, don't worry, I'm going to paraphrase, but I'll give you a link if you want to see the actual letter. Don't worry, we've taken everything from them. They have nothing. They're old, they're young, some are infirm, many are women and children. If they do manage to get out of Manzanar and have any, pose any threat, they will easily be exterminated. And that was the word that the War Department used. And I think it's instructive for us to remember. So when we hear calls for bans or walls or limitations or threats to our way of life, I don't think my mother posed a threat to anybody's way of life. Um, and I think it's important for us to remember that those calls, those words, those demagogic, racist, xenophobic appeals, they have consequences. And they have consequences that can affect real people in ways that we uh, obviously goes against the very nature of our, of our Constitution, goes very, against the very nature of our country. Uh, this year at the 50th, um, I don't know how worn, you know, <laughs> I'm only here because my mother obviously uh, in many ways, but also because Warren, my mother went back in 1969, voluntarily this time, um, the first time wasn't voluntary, but she went back in 69 and, and, uh, and, and worked with Warren for all those years to establish Manzanar as a national historic site and then as a national park. And, and I think this year we're going to have Dale Manami who was the lead attorney in the Coram Nobis cases, who was so instrumental in overturning the Korematsu and Yasui and Hirabayashi cases. We're gonna have uh, Fred's daughter, uh, Karen Korematsu, and both are gonna speak about the, their efforts to support um, uh, Neil Katyal, who was sued the, the current administration, uh, trying to overturn this Muslim ban, and their efforts to educate our country about the threat that xenophobia and racism and this hysteria, this anti-immigrant hysteria that is being whipped up and, 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 and articulated from the very places, the White House and the halls of power where Executive Order 9066 was signed and, and from the very places that our families um, well, you know, were subjected to that same type of, of demagogic racist appeals. So that's what we, we, we're a little more relevant than we want to be. We wish we could stand here and just congratulate um, all of our, our, our elders and our community for the hard work, their perseverance and their sacrifices. But our tale is a cautionary tale. And the victories like this VGM Memorial or the establishment of Manzanar or the victories of, executive, of, of the Civil Liberties Act of 1988, these would be hollow victories if we don't learn from our past and if we from this community that was so devastated by the xenophobic actions of our own government. If we do not today stand up for those that are being persecuted 
and defend their rights. Since no one did that for our families back in 1942, except the Quakers. It's important that we understand that that is our legacy. And I think that's what we are going to try and communicate this year at the 50th Manzanar Pilgrimage. Thank you.